Hello out there. Is everybody ready to go? Everybody ready? Okay, here we go. One, two. Hey, good morning, everybody. And that song is called Avalon. That song was written in 1920 by, listen to this, by Al Jolson, Buddy De Silva, and Vincent Rose. And actually, it's referring to Avalon, California. My entire life, I've played that song, and I always thought it was Avalon, New Jersey. So when I looked this up to see who wrote it and get some background on it, I just found out it's referring to Avalon, California. That, by the way, is a jazz standard. I mean, what, written in 1920? People are still playing it today. I play it just about every gig that I do, and it's mostly played by Dixieland bands or straight ahead, let's say, like a bass, drums, piano type of trio. It's what was called a standard. And actually, I think it was made famous by Benny Goodman's uh, quartet when they played it in their famous 1938 Carnegie Hall concert. So that's where it got its kickoff, and uh, it's a wonderful song. So uh, this morning, before we get started, though, uh, we have a Patreon, Stephen Landry, $5. And Stephen, thank you very much. It's very much appreciated. Just for you out there who don't know what I'm talking about, we have a program called Patreon where People watching us uh, contribute so much money every month, and it could be a dollar or two or five or ten or a hundred dollars, whatever it is, and it helps to, for the ongoingness of this show. It's the only way we uh, get support on it because we don't have any sponsors, so that frees us up to do exactly what we want to do, which I want that freedom to be always held at this end here. So if you'd like to contribute, and instead of just being a listener or an enlightened person listening to the show, you become a participant. You're doing something about it. You're helping out on this end. So now, without any further ado, <coughs> I want to bring, um, well, she's always a special guest, and her take on a lot of things is very enlightening, and you're going to enjoy what she has to say today because this is some important stuff we're giving out to you about the Church of Scientology and about their shenanigans and about their Evil purposes. I shouldn't even refer to them as a church because they're not. It's a cult of Scientology. So please welcome Karen DeLaCuria. Good morning, Karen. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Okay, so there she is. And I got some notes that I'll be referring to occasionally. And we're going to start off with, you know, David Miscavige is blamed for a lot of things originating with him, a lot of bad stuff like beating on people and stuff like that. We want to show you what the source of this was many years before David ever got to be the chairman of the board of the entire Church of Scientology. So let's get started on this. And the spitting in the face and the slapping, how did that get started, Karen? Yes, uh, I'd like to introduce a word that is an action done frequently in the cult. The word, the word is called rollback. And rollback is a technique where, as you can imagine, when a whole bunch of people are living together, hundreds of people, Sea Org members, the clergy, live together. Rumors float around. There's, there's rumors and Sometimes there's a voice of disaffection. And it could be relatively innocent. It's like, this is the 10th week we're getting $20 for, for payroll for the whole week. Now that goes into a procedure called rollback. Karen, b before, are you mm -hmm. saying the word R-O-L-L-B-A-C-K, rollback? Yes. 
Okay. Exactly. I just want to, I want to clear that up to make sure whoever is listening gets exactly that word because this is important uh, on what you're going to reveal here. Yeah, I don't think rollback has been discussed on the air, so here you go. Yeah. So what happens is because it's a snitching culture where everybody wraps out everybody else to look good, everybody reports to the hierarchy. So if somebody hears some disaffection, something negative, it's somebody will tattle tape and write it to ethics, to the master and arms, ripping off naval titles, rip it off to the ethics section, which is the division that has the power to punish you for you to become more ethical. Once this arrives in ethics, it becomes, it travels along a conveyor belt to do rollback. So the person who said this bad thing, hey, we're not getting paid. This is the 10th week we've had almost little to no pay. That person is holding, they sit down, and the question is, where did you hear this? Who told you this? And then that person says, well, da, 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 da. then the next, then it goes down a chain to find the who. And the who is the last, the first person that said it. And that person can't remember hearing it from an earlier person. This is called roll back. Right. So they're rolling back to who started this bad thing. They're trying to find out if it was just spread on the grapevine. If it was just spread on the grapevine, well, who is the who? Mm -hmm. Then the who would be the target of the disciplinary action. Or the, the source of the entire thing. Is the that right? Source. Yeah. The source, the original creator of that. So in this particular session today, we were using a little bit, we're going to be using a little bit of rollback. Good. It was known at InBase that people were spitting on each other. Now, again, I've got to divert a little bit before getting into the stories. Scientology, when you are staff or CEO, has a huge technique of humiliation. Not just punishment, humiliation. Do they do that in the Marines? Never. In the Marines, if you do something that's not ethical or keeping up with the standards, you'll receive a punishment, and it could be, uh, you know, being restricted to the barracks or, oh, I, you know, I, offhand, I, I can't think of anything. Maybe doing some digging a ditch or something like that, but you don't get humiliated with that. And once you, that punishment is meted out and it, you, they see that you, you turned a good leaf, you've come to your senses, so to speak, saying, hey, you know, I'm not going to do that stuff anymore. That's the end of it. That's the end of it. But usually guys who get into stuff like that, what they call troublemakers, are the guys you want on your side if you go to war because they're, they're the ones who's likely to be active Whereas the person who every, everything he does is perfect. You know, he never says wrong words. His pants are always pressed. And, you know, the, the, the goody two-shoes guy, you don't want him in, in, when the shit hits the fan. But anyway, in answer to your question, the short answer is no. The humiliation is not added to the punishment in the Marine Well, Corps. in the last 30 years and worse in the last 20 years and way worse in the last 10, it just gets worse and worse. Humiliation is incorporated into any punishment. You're right. For example, if you're supposed to go clean a toilet, you're forced to go clean a toilet with a toothbrush. Yeah. And this cleaning with a toothbrush, um, for example, instead of just digging to do some construction work, you'll be t forced to go clean out a dumpster with a toothbrush. Yep. Imagine the size of a dumpster and imagine that you've got to get it spotlessly clean 
by cleaning it with a toothbrush. You heard of those dumpster punishments and toilet. Of course I have. Of course I have. Yeah. And just it's imagine the state of mind who of a person who would go along with that. Because if you can get a person to do that, man, I'll tell you, he's under your spell. He's done from there on out until he looks at himself in the mirror someday and says, what the fuck am I doing here, you know? Anyway, go well, on, Karen. The whole thing is to sort of crush, collapse your world. Yeah. Make, shrink you down into, this is what happened to me at InFace. And this could be a large part of why I still to speak out. Oh, my they, I was crushed, pulverized. Yeah. I did not have command. I did not have space. I was shrunk down way below the size of a pea. I don't think I, I, I just didn't have any space. I was so introverted and interiorized. And this went on month after month after month after month. Yeah. So the whole idea was to... So the whole idea of punishment in the cult is to shrink you down in size and space You're right. to immobilize you and make you unable to even function. Some people would just be dysfunctional. So we were we are going to use the rollback, which we explain very carefully. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you, I'm going to start off with a little story. There was a beautiful girl on the ship called Jill Goodman. Just a real beauty. Training to be a messenger, and then she got through all the training. Now, in the 1970s, of course, that was way, way before internet. The way Hubbard ran his day is he would have messengers run all over the ship to deliver a message from him. And then the messenger would run back all the flights upstairs of the ship and give the answer back to Hubbard. That's why the word messenger, because they were running messages. They did other work, but they were running messages I primarily. Yeah. So Hubbard sent a message to his glamorous, beautiful, long red-headed daughter, Diana. Her office was only 30 feet away from his research room, which was his office. But, and this beautiful messenger, Jill, relayed the message. And then Diana said something that Hubbard did not like. So the next message run, Jill was told to go back to Diana and spit in her face. Get this now. This is the founder of a religion writing reams of things that look good. Affinity, reality, communication. You don't cause a break in it by enforcing reality. And he sends this cute, this little cutie, Jill Goodman, to go spit in his daughter's face, which he did. But bad luck for her, Hubbard's wife at the time, Mary Sue Hubbard, was behind Jill when Jill spat in the face of Diana. And she just slapped Jill back and forth, back and forth, took off her shoes, Mary Sue Hubbard, the head of the guardian's office, and hurled the shoes at Jill. And all of this you can read. This is this is <laughs> documented in the book Commodore Messenger. Right. Riding out the storm. I think it's page 338. The whole story if you want it. But the reason I bring now, oh, this wait wait a up, minute. I should bring this out that Janice Grady who wrote that was yeah. a messenger for what? six years or 11 years? She was for 11 years at the side of Hubbard six hours a day. So you got first-hand reports here. Right. Okay. This is not just some uh, fairy tale. This, is, this was 
This is history. Okay. The reason we're talking about it is Hubbard, he was always running the show. These, these fake, false things that he had resigned. He said on video, I resigned. I'm only the writer of the text. No, he ran it all. And while running it all, he would send down orders, even when he was in hiding. Other than the last year when his dementia really increased and he was just not, not, not making <clears throat> sense, pursuing the BT, pursuing Dutch spirits and wanting a suicide machine built to when he lost it, but right up, he was gone six years and he truly was running the show. And in one of the advices, we, <laughs> again, Scientology changes the definition of the word, this is a propaganda thing, by calling, instead of saying it's a Hubbard order, <laughs> it we call an advice, yeah. because his identity was consultant rather than executive director right so the order was go find john axel and spit in his face and john, john axel, axel was who john axel was a long-term sea org member a brit and he was for many years he was in what we call the evaluator division evaluator corps he did evals. Evaluation was to do, to really do a thorough analysis on a, on a satellite church. Mostly they were done on outer churches. And to find the who, <laughs> according to Hubbard, statistics didn't drift down because of abysmal conduct of staff or because of gouging public for all they were worth. Statistics were held down by a malicious who causing the trouble. And evals were done to find the who. Anyway, John Axel had various posts, but I'm just telling you, when I was in, he was always circling around the evaluator area. Right. So, that was a Hubbard order. And David Miscavige went, and this was recorded all over on the internet, and spat in the face of John Axel. And do you know what? That was the birth and origin point of people using spitting. Others spat on others. People spat on others. Miscavige spat on Mark Yeager numerous times. This was a spitting. It became a spitting culture which goes back to our earlier opening of humiliation. Ron, what would it, what does it feel like to be spat on when you can't spit back? Listen, I was never spat on, but I can tell you there were times when I was humiliated or given a verbal lashing. And the fact that you can't do anything is just, it goes right against my grain. And I think any civilized person doesn't like to be humiliated or punished where you can't do anything to back up how you feel. It feels horrible. You feel like, how did I get myself into this? What can I do about it? And then in the back of your mind, you're thinking, I've got to tolerate this because this technology is going to handle every man, woman, and child on this planet and make it a better place to live. You're working against your own mind, and then that makes you tolerate that shit. We swallowed that, didn't we? Yeah. Scientology was going to save the planet. Yep. <laughs> they, I swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. I mean, I've said this before, but I recruited people to get in Scientology. I recruited people for the Sea Organization. I used to do videos telling how wonderful the lectures were. And if you get these, you're going to enlighten you and you're going to lead a better life. Listen, that's the best prison you can build is get the person to build his own mental prison. How yes. do you get out of that? How do you escape from that? And I'll tell you, it goes right against the grain of any human being 
because any human being does not want to be wrong. So for you to stand in front of the mirror and say, you know what, this is bullshit. I've been conned. That's one of the toughest things you can do. And if you can, but if you can do that, that's the beginning of your being entrapped. That is the beginning of it. Then as you start searching out information about who trapped you and you get on the internet, thank God for the internet because prior to that, uh, people had no way of finding out, you know, what, a, what about the church? Well, now the toothpaste is out of the tube. And as time goes by and you get more and more in information and about Hubbard's life and about the lies he told about his war record and about the things he did, you slowly start coming out of it. And then as you emerge, you'll be a free man and enjoy life the way it's supposed to be enjoyed, just loving your fellow man and everybody around you and being successful at whatever you do and uh, enjoying life. You, you don't enjoy life when you're in a position where somebody can spit in your face or just call you every name of the book and you can't think, do anything about it. That's as about as bad as it gets. Well, the reason you can't do anything about it is very, very strong indoctrination on higher up. You cannot respond negatively to a senior. Well, you yeah, but to... Karen, I'll, I will interrupt you just for a second. There's not only that, but you you may be surrounded, well, not in your immediate vicinity, but maybe like two or three or 400 people who there's no way you as an individual are going to take on that many people. You may get a beating from a lot of people not may. This has happened to people already. Go on. Yeah, so, but, but you know, it isn't just the belief. It's because you've hardly been paid and because the cult has slowly made you, cut you off from all of family, yeah. just don't have a place to go. And how would you live? How would you eat? You're, you're right. That's all changed. This is a new era. Yeah. Aftermath Foundation is an <coughs> entity that handles people who just fled, who just escaped. They they sometimes they often don't have a driver's license. They don't have a bank account, and they don't have a resume to get hired. What do you do? You say, I just worked for a cult for the last 20 years. What, what, what was your previous job? I worked for the cult of Scientology yeah. for the last 15 years. That's your resume to yeah. get a new job? Whoa. Yeah. The Aftermath Foundation has been set up. People give donations and so on. So escapees, or if someone has someone in and they need them, to get a soft landing, the Aftermath Foundation is something you and I never had. Whoa. Yeah. In our day, <laughs> we fled sink or swim. That's right. So, I, <laughs> so I'm really, uh, I really support the Aftermath Foundation. Oh, I do too. And these, you know, Leah and Mike and you yeah. know, Mark and Aaron, the people who run it, they're, they're wonderful people. I, I'll tell you, that's... That's true charity. That's real, what you call benefiting your fellow man. As a matter of fact, they deserve more of a title to be a church than the fucking Church of Scientology, if you come right down to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is a soft landing. A person jumps out of the airplane, all of a sudden, some one of these people put a parachute on his back, and he's coming down safely. It's actually wonderful. It really is. So... So now, if anybody flees, all they have to do is get to a library, Google Aftermath Foundation, and boom, their life can, they can be, they, there are resources in every city in the United States, they, there are resources internationally. If they're fleeing the church in Denmark, St. Hill, England, whatever. Anyway, so... So we, the spitting, the spitting, we bring up because it's a type of humiliation. Yes. And when you are pulverized and clobbered, where you just shrink into the size of a dot, you don't have oomph to, 
fight back or be you just you you collapse yeah. you mentally and spiritually collapse so one of hubbard's fatal flaws was to crush you in punishment that that horrible horrible essay he wrote in the green volumes uh use to use discipline to up the discipline to make it too gruesome to make punishment so gruesome that people would live in terror that they might get punished the so of uh, it became it became became a dangerous environment yep you never knew what horrific punishment you would end up later that day maybe march to the rpf what it so we're rolling back the humiliation david miscavige gets a lot of bad publicity for his cruelty but actually hubbard was the source of spitting yep now was hubbard the source of violence absolutely he was um there was a messenger called trudy that there are some nice oh i wish i had the pictures up hubbard gave her away as a bride on the same day he gave terry terry uh terry jerry. married jerry armstrong right. terry and jerry and trudy married pat broker pat the guy who lived with hubbard the last six years of his life pat broker yeah and trudy and pat got married on the same day uh trudy was slapped so violently by hubbard that she was hurled across the room and this was a girl and this was an un, a teenager 18 or 19 years old and again what is the source of this look around page 340 this is a book which we're, if if you're a scientology watcher and you want to know the earlier history read the book you can even buy it on kindle commodore messenger writing out the storm right so i mean hubbard punched otto roos hubbard punched belkazan furge let no one think that hubbard could keep his cool he could not he wrote all these texts for scientology but when he went into a temper tantrum he was out of control he was not in control you know i've heard that from numerous people and thing i heard from that's, <laughs> that says it all right there yeah. Yeah. but you're right he was the source on all this and that's no excuse for David doing it, but David was not the source of the spitting and the punching. That started with the founder of Scientology himself, L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah, yeah. It got replicated and copied, and then it came down the command chain. Yeah. Then people were slapping each other. There's a guy who's been extorting money, I don't know if he's still alive, called Dave Foster, the husband of Harriet Foster. At the flag land base dave foster has been a sales agent a registrar for 30 40 years yeah and one day a public was not coughing up the money he wanted and he violently slapped her face in the registrar office mia pia cardini uh an italian woman who subsequently she's she's died now but she wrote she wrote the book on it and this was like wow this slapping and her, it's assault and battery i don't believe one single person has ever reported to clearwater pd the internal punching and slapping that occurs yeah at flag. i'm sure you're right i'm sure you're right you don't dare do it it's just too much up against you're wanting to make things go right in that direction it just you have to confront too much and in the state of mind you're in you don't want to even do it you, you feel that somehow you pulled it in there's another thing that bullshit they tell you oh well 
You got punched. Why well, you pulled it in? What did you do bad that you pulled that in? <laughs> right? Well, you know, I think that it's good to see that Howard set the tone and created this scenario. Now, it's it's not an excuse that other people slapped other people. They did it. Whoever was the perpetrator did it. But I do want to say that people look to source yeah. and people look to Hubbard for leadership. Yep. So if that was good for Hubbard, Hubbard sent down another advice saying, when you see WDC smile, go spit in his face for me. WDC smile means Watchdog Committee, Scientology Missions International. Senior, senior executive. Yeah. And Hubbard sends down a message saying, go spit in his face. So this wasn't an isolated thing. This was a humiliation technique which was done deliberately on purpose. One human being to humiliate another human being. Yes. And I think it's really important to tell these stories because the glamour and the glitz of these inter events with perfect dress and perfect hair and perfect makeup. And then you lift up the curtains and see what, yeah. <laughs> what goes on behind. It is not a pretty picture. No, nope, you're totally right, Karen. I'll tell you. And along with that stage setup, you have these big marble <coughs> pillars and, uh, it's made out of styrofoam. You can pick one up with one hand. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's all, it's all, it's smoke and mirrors. What you're seeing is what you, the church wants you to see and think. What actually yeah. brings that about and behind the scenes goes on all the time. They don't want you to know it all. And that's what you're telling about today. And I appreciate that. Well, you know, um, although this is merging a little bit into sort of the cult attitude on drugs, th there was a girl who was so, again, this crushing technique, the cult will humiliate and crush. There was another messenger, uh, <clears throat> a girl who called Rachel Donahue. You knew Rachel, Absolutely. Right? Very, very Rachel. nice girl, very pretty girl. Just, yeah. a, a very, just a nice person, you know what I mean? Yes. Really nice person. Just, just yeah. a nice person to be around. Well, Ron, the, the point is she wasn't fast enough for Hubbard. If you were on Hubbard's lines, by lines meaning the work you did landed up on his, you know, his plate. Yeah. <laughs> I was an auditor under Hubbard. I never got busted. I never got humiliated by Hubbard. I never experienced spitting. I, I didn't have those things. However... I heard all the stories on a cross flow. Right. And Rachel uh, just wasn't, she wasn't, she wasn't, didn't have the speed of light. Yeah, no, no she was she never quick in the uptake. I, I can tell you. Slow. She yeah. was slow. And Hubbard had this theory that if you were slow and stupid, or if you were just not with it, not fast enough, you were a druggie. Yeah. You either had been doing drugs or you came from a history. Maybe you were cool now, but you mm. probably smoked dope <laughs> for years, whatever. So the so Rachel was sent to session, but she was second generation. She never did drugs ever, ever. She didn't even take medication. It seemed like she didn't even ha she hadn't even taken cough cough syrup. So Hubbard's theory that she was slow because of drugs seemed a little, eh. Yeah. Really? So then Hubbard had a moment where the lights went off and he got it. Rachel was slow and not, I mean, she was, she wasn't autistic. She wasn't, she wasn't slowed down to the point where she couldn't function. She just wasn't fast enough right so hubbard's 
revelation that he thought his her mother must have taken LSD when pregnant with Rachel. And once that is said, it can never be changed because he could never come up with the wrong answer. Correct? Oh, poor Rachel. That was she it. was hauled into session for weeks. <clears throat> wow. To run out her being a fetus and baby in the womb while her mother was doing it. Nobody knows exactly what went on in those sessions, but I will tell you, Rachel came out in absolute, the end result was she was terrified of making a mistake. Did the auditing make her feel great and expanded and causative and faster? No, she was more mousified. She was more crushed and pulverized. Imagine, Ron, can you imagine if Hubbard said, you know, you're not, a, you're, you're not quite a crackerjack musician because when you were in the womb, your mother took LSD. What a judgment. Well, I'll tell you what I would have had to do. I would have been sent in session, and until I came up with some incident that that happened, totally imaginary, totally imaginary, I made it up. If I hadn't come up with that, I would be in session for the rest of my normal life trying to come up with an actual incident that caused it. I could never say it didn't happen and get out of session. That's how that would go. And I'm sure that's what happened with Rachel. Who knows what the hell she said. She could have made up the whole thing just to get out of sitting there and being forced into admitting something that didn't happen. Anyway, um, th this thing on drugs as being the drugs, the, the, there's an absolute fixed idea which comes from Harvard. Yeah. In fact, Scientology is so fanatical about drugs that there are seven different layers of Scientology, seven different levels of Scientology to make you flush out your drugs. You're, you, you might walk into the cult desperately needing to handle an issue with your child or with your spouse or with a business partner, whatever, but you must robotically go sit in the sauna and spread out five hours a day and take massive vitamins. That's just like one size fits all. Yeah. You're not going to get auditing till you've flushed out your drugs. Right. Purification right now. Then, this is really bad. This is bad. People are being forced onto mandatory objectives, survival rundown, for over 100 hours, sometimes 200 hours. This is enforced on everyone. What do you do for 100 hours, 200 hours? You're given a command to walk over to a wall, touch a wall, pick up a bottle. What is its weight? Pick up a pick up a book. Walk to the other wall, and robotically repeat this over and over, hour after hour. Maybe even two hundred hours. Yeah. I know people who've been doing this for two years on weekends. Wow. Two years. That's and they keep doing it because they've been shown some paper saying that if they keep doing this, they're going to move out of their body <laughs> and get remote viewing. So they keep hoping and they keep doing this. Well, as you know, I was a case supervisor on all this technical stuff, and I CS hundreds of hours of this book and model walk over to the wall. I did not get one case on my desk that left their body and were able to see their body from above or have some form of 
remote viewing. If I say the word exteriorization, it won't be understood. So I'm going to say remote viewing, yeah. which yeah. means you can see from outside the body. Hogwash, yeah. lies, bullshit, money extortion for no result. And do you know they put OT8s back on this? <laughs> Yes, I do know that. OTA, yeah. They put them back on pure fun survival rundown. They rotate. God damn. You go high up and you start at the bottom. Well, one of the wildest things in Scientology is you get different drug rundowns and you recall when you took the drug and all that. But one of the most wildest things is that you do drug counseling, drug counseling to your attached spirits on a level called OT4, which means that Hubbard believed that your attached spirits also had drug history down the time track. Mm -hmm. And what the procedures are to then audit out the drugs, <laughs> audit out the drugs in your, in Scientology, as you hit higher levels, you are not a single entity. There's not just you in the body. You are like four million encrusted attached spirits attached to the body and attached to you. And that's what's called OT3, the wall of fire, indoctrinating you that you are multiples. Now, OT4 is a level where you actually handle drugged entities or spirits that are... Ron, you got to talk. I'm talking a lot. Tell no, me no. your view. No, the, you, you're, you're right. I mean, th this is... This is something that you could go on forever searching out entities that are attached to your body uh, or even at a distance having aligned to your body. And the, actually, the end result of all this, as you pointed out just a minute ago, after you get through all of these upper levels, you should be able to do remote viewing. Karen, I was in Scientology for 42 years. I was on staff for 26 and a half I never met one person who could do remote viewing, not one single individual. So all of this is an exercise in futility. It is like telling a dog that uh, you're, you're not a good dog until you get rid of all of your fleas, but the dog doesn't have any fleas by actual examination. So it, maybe it's a bad analogy, but I, I think you get my point that Somehow these entities are running your life, which nothing could be further from the truth. Because as an individual, you run your own life. What you think and do determine what type of person you are and how successful you are at whatever you do. Uh, saying these little imaginary creatures are making you into what you are, it just doesn't hold water. I don't know if I did enough on that, but you know, that's, that's my take on it. But you're in such a state of mind that when you get to that point, you've had a certain amount of successes at the lower part of the bridge. Even though you might not believe this or, or you question it, you accept it because that's how your mind is at the time. You accept it. Now, by accepting it, now you're off and running. Do you, do you think that was... Yeah. Th there are a certain amount of wins, so-called wins gotten in all these procedures. Yeah. I'm not talking about handling entities. I'm talking about when you just sit down with one person and they are trained to make you, the sun rises and sets with you. They are only, this is an auditor, a counselor. They are only there to hear you and you cathartically unburden your soul. Yeah. You get off what you need to. You can you can feel better. You, you can have wins. Not you can. You absolutely do feel you do. better. You do. You're and right. And then people think, wow, that, that was cool. And they get, they, they want that. They want one person listening to their deepest yeah. secrets or 
things that bother them and stuff. So I don't want, so the, the hooks and the bait is these winds yeah. are completely transitory. They come and go. Yep. They are not stable. And certainly people who have done uh, 3Ls and OT8 and all the high, they've done everything the cult has asked them to. And then what? They, they, some have had mental breakdowns. They've gotten alcoholic. They've beaten up their wives. They're in bankruptcy. And more importantly, they do huge financial fraud. Yeah. It's almost like every six months or every year, there's some huge, huge, right now it's David Gentile, uh, a guy who had two children in the sea organization and bought some nice property and lived in Clearwater. And he has had $700 million vanish into thin air on his funds. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, he's been kicked off. Um, uh, well, what they normally do is completely distance themselves as soon as someone is up to shenanigans. The thing is, oh, they, they, they did, they haven't done Scientology for a while. They, they were out of parameter or whatever. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is people who do it all, whether they're dentists or <laughs> like that infamous New York, they Later on, it's found out that they were ripping off Medi-Cal, ripping off Medicaid. This, this, these are people who have done all this high spiritual work. Yeah. OT8 is the pinnacle of how far you can go. So auditing out all their drugged BTs, their drugged entities, and attesting OT4 does not make them one inch iota more ethical nope. or more sane because there's history case after history case of Scientology criminals. Yep. Criminals, absolute criminal activity. But then you look at what did they do? The church was supposed to make them more ethical. Ethical? <laughs> <laughs> so the tech is flawed, absolutely flawed. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree with you more. It is uh, smoke and mirrors. It's like the Wizard of Oz turned out to be a guy behind the curtain pulling levers and smoke coming out of stuff and a big picture of somebody else. And uh, this is what the Church of Scientology is. And this idea of getting rid of entities that are fastened to your body is going to make you powerful and make you into something that you never will be. It's just a fake story. It's simple. Oh, the, big, the biggest misconception is you get rid of all of these and you're going to become ethical. Well, yeah. people have run their entities for 20 years and they are not one iota more ethical. None. Exactly. None of them. And, so, and, so, and, yeah. and how about LSD? That is the big no-no of all. Yet, oh. who, who was an LSD case? Well, a famous person who did something that only he Ray could do. Midoff, Ray Midoff was the most senior, senior of all of technology. In fact, he was so trusted and so competent that he was sent to audit the dying L. Ron Hubbard. He's as the most senior tech terminal. And he was an LSD case. He had taken LSD. So they don't allow anyone who's ever taken LSD to join the SEAL. What, a, <laughs> what an escape hatch. I want to congratulate everyone in the world. You won't be eligible to be drawn into that rat's nest. <laughs> Your LSD was one of the biggest blessings that you... <laughs> I, I know, actually, you, you, you're making a point. That actually happens to be true. And uh, if you had not taken it, you might be in a very bad position today or 
maybe like Karen, who's a very successful entrepreneur, a successful art dealer, uh, and other people like Mark Headley, who got out and he does things audio visualize that he's probably the top guy in that business. Um, yet they went through this kind of a holocaust. I don't know if we could call it that, but it, it was uh, it was an exercise in like I, I wouldn't want to do it again. Let's put it that way. Well, Ron, there are a lot of survivors. Yep. But to survive and lead a good, healthy life, a happy life. Yeah. You know, the escapee, there are a lot of, there's a lot of happiness oh, and yeah. a lot of camaraderie and a lot of joy and, and, uh, but it's not when you are in the seal. Nope. That is the, you know, that's the nightmare part of the life. But once you escape all of Scientology, uh, life is good. Yeah. Life is good. It really is. And, and this is, uh, there's a special bond that you have with other people who have done the same thing. It's just like uh, people who were, who are not war, who served in the Marine Corps, there's a brotherhood there. Yes. There's an actual brotherhood there. You say Semper Fi, and then another Marine, you know, whether he's a brand new recruit out of boot camp or somebody in for 20 years or somebody who's 80 years, it doesn't matter. You'll always be a Marine. And I guess in the final analysis, <laughs> will always be the escapees of an unbelievable suppressive cult. And that's got to be a little bit of a medal that we get out and we're doing okay. Yep. What do you think? I think that we hit a good point there. Is there a lesson learned? Yeah, what would be the lesson learned? One, never put all your faith in a guru. That, Don't that. <laughs> that that is a point and a half. And I guess <laughs> another lesson you could get out of it is this. If you watch shows like this, you know, interview shows that I do, or other people who do them, you will learn from other people's mistakes who then corrected them and got out. But why make the mistake when you hear other people saying what it cost them in terms of their life and livingness? And thank God, those who got out are, I guess, all successful. But you can learn from that, from watching these shows, and learn the me modus operandi that they use, which is hooking you in with some very nice things to begin with, and then based on those hooks in you, feed you stuff that now you accept to be true. I may have gone a little long-winded on that, but I think when you said, don't ever believe in a girl, I mean, we could, we could end it with that. <laughs> And I want to give a final plug for the Aftermath Foundation. I don't mind you if, if you do that. That's anybody, anybody who knows anybody who's just escaped or trying to escape or whatever, there is a wonderful golden parachute soft landing where a whole foundation will get this person stabilized, a job, uh, everything that they need to start a new life. You are no longer in fear that if you escape, you are on your own. Okay, so I think it's... I think That's good, uh, but wait before we end off, my producer has given me a signal here. Go on, Sean. So, Ron, you have a super chat for $5 from Teresa Atkins that says, I wish it could be more, Ron. You do life-saving work. Could you say that again? Because sure. I have a hard, hard, hard time hearing you, buddy. Sure, it was, uh, I wish it could... I wish it could be more, Ron. You do life-saving work. Oh, I thank you very much, Teresa. That's very nice of you. And thank you for calling in. Uh, I'd like to end off because I think we, we made our point that we wanted to make. All of you out there who are not patrons, if you feel like doing this, join up today. And uh, if, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. We're going to still do the show, so obviously. But get somebody else to tune in. See if we can increase the membership by about 10 times what it is. So a lot more people can benefit from the enlightenment we give here. And Karen, I want to especially thank you because you're always, you always have a great insightful take on many things that, that maybe I don't think about, maybe other people don't think about. But it, it's very enlightening having you on and actually enjoyable on my part. Okay? Thank you. Thank okay. you, Ron. All right. Bye -bye, so Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. And uh, this is Life After Scientology. 
I'm your host, Ron Miscavige. I will see you on the next episode. Bye-bye.